Here at Marquette University, we have so many amazing scholars researching, writing, and teaching about gender issues. And these gender scholars work in a wide range of areas and disciplines from across our campus. Recognizing this, the Institute for Women's Leadership is excited to announce the launch of our Research Spotlight series. Our goal for the series is to highlight some of the wonderful gender-related research being done on campus and with partners beyond its borders. Each month, we will showcase one scholar in a recorded video discussion. And during these discussions, we will hear about their research and the sometimes personal stories that led to it. I think you'll find these conversations as enlightening as I did, and I do hope that you'll tune in. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this episode of the Research Spotlight series hosted by the Institute for Women's Leadership. Our goal for the series is to shine a light on some of the phenomenal scholars at Marquette University and the incredible work that they're doing. I'm Dr. Jenica Webster, co-director of the Institute and associate professor in the College of Business. Today we have with us Dr. Darren Wheelock, an associate professor of social and cultural sciences and director of the criminal justice analytics program here at Marquette. He will be sharing with us his work examining the connection between public attitudes towards criminal punishment and views towards racial minorities. So, Darren, before we dive into your research, can, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, I'm, uh, I grew up in Minnesota, so I, 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 I am well acquainted with the upper Midwest. Um, I moved here here being Milwaukee about 15 years ago. Um, I completed my doctorate at the University of Minnesota. Then um, my wife and I decided that we kind of wanted to stay in the Midwest. We have Midwest sensibilities, Midwestern values. And so of the job offers that were on the table, we thought that Marquette would be the best fit. And it's also really close to home if I ever needed to go back to Minnesota for something. So, um, yeah, and so now I am uh, in my 15th year, I think, wow, years go by fast, at uh, Marquette University as a professor. I teach a range of classes from intro to criminology to race, crime, and punishment to statistics to our uh, senior capstone. Wonderful. Thank you. So for that background, um, so yeah, let's jump into it. So can you tell us, can you provide a, an overview of, of your research program? Sure. Um, I have two primary threads of scholarship. Um, one, as you mentioned, examines public sentiment regarding criminal justice policies. And what research consistently demonstrates is that the way people understand or think or support certain policies is generally less fueled by how they understand crime or punishment and more fueled by how they, what their views are towards um, racial and ethnic minorities. Um, so that, that in and of itself says a lot <laughs> about, you know, one might uh, assume that, well, someone's fearfulness of crime, for example, might inform how they support you know, three strikes outlaws or three strikes near outlaws, but that's not necessarily the case, right? We tend to find things that racial animus, different measures of racial attitudes are better predictors of um, someone's support for criminal justice policies. And then the other thread of my research examines the system itself and um, ways in which we oftentimes, we find these hidden inequalities in the system. For example, um, collateral consequences are these laws that activate um, after you've been convicted of a felony that can prohibit individual from voting, from serving on a jury, from obtaining certain kinds of jobs, from obtaining housing. So you can imagine if there's inequality that's feeding into the system, then on the back end what's happening is that we're exacerbating all those inequalities with these types of policies. And so I'm really interested in that link between inequality and the system and, and how people get in and then ultimately what is the impact when they've left. Uh, yeah, so, you know, a lot of the, the theme in your research is looking at racial minorities. Um, but can you tell us a little bit about how gender could also play a role in these two themes that you just identified? Great question. And it's an important question. 
And, you know, it, it's funny because I, I appreciate it so much because it forces me to address what can sometimes be a blind spot in my research is that I take the way that the system is so for granted that at times you forget, oh, no, this, the process through and through is, is, is thoroughly engendered, right, about how we see both the sorting of men and women on the front end and then what happens when they're inside and then on the back end as well. And it plays off of a couple of different, I think, what are common stereotypes or tropes that we have. As one, we have the, the hyper-criminalization of young Black men. So that informs a lot of what criminal justice policy has been about for approximately the last 40 years, um, that these populations have been really targeted in many different ways. But what we've seen is we've seen some changing dynamics unfold. And I guess that's one of the, <clears throat> um, that's one of the things that really draws me to this area is that this isn't, these stories aren't just neat, simple, and clean. They're oftentimes highly nuanced and complicated because something that we have seen is we have seen the, 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 um, the demographic that has experienced the highest growth in prison rates is actually women. Now, part of that is because generally speaking, women imprisonment rate baselines were so low, but then they also got caught up in mass incarceration as well, right? Few people were saved from that, including uh, poor whites. We saw men of color, but also women as well. And when we saw that, though, that again was highly targeted, really focused on women of color. And now we actually see a, a situation where we see incarceration rates for women of color being comparable to that of white men, which again is historically um, something that we have just never really quite seen before. But it gets even more complicated than that because this isn't really my area, but it's related is you start thinking about um, violence as a, as, a, as, a, as a concept or an area of exploration. And we see violence itself is, 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 is really um, engendered as well, right? We see domestic violence, sexual violence, and those forms of violence where we see women being the not exclusive, but the overwhelming majority of victims. And then, but what's really ironic is that we oftentimes associate shame and stigma with victimization for crimes in which women are more likely to be victims of, but not necessarily men. For example, it's not really, it's not a stigmatizing or necessarily a shaming experience to be a victim of, let's say, a robbery, right? Someone, you know, a strong arm robbery, or they pull a weapon, they take your stuff, and it's an act of violence. But then if you start talking about domestic violence, sexual assault, those things, the, the, the stigma can actually be associated with being a victim in those types of offenses. So we see the role of gender playing out in all sorts of ways. And, and then on the back end, when people are leaving the system and they're undergoing reentry, we see the instances in which a lot of the, <clears throat> like, again, we see the, the prison population itself is still uh, overwhelmingly um, men, but we see instances in which <clears throat> women themselves are now trying to experience reentry, and we see fewer programming for women, right? Most of the programming is really set up to assist men in that process, and, and to be sure, even that program is, there's not enough of it, right, for men, but you can imagine then for women, there's even less than that, right? So then they're up against a situation where they're trying to start their lives or, or to re-enter their lives again, and there's very little support for them to be able to do so. Right. That is, that's incredibly interesting. So I'm going to ask you, how, you know, how, how did you come to be interested in this area? So was there a, a question or a challenge that you were setting out to address? You know, what's the, the origin of your story? Well, um, if we go all the way back, um, and to be perfectly frank, I was, uh, let's say, a restless child. I made a lot of mistakes and I did a lot of regretful things. And I had also been caught up in the system. Um, I had gotten into trouble for a good portion, proportion of or a good segment of my youth. And so <clears throat> a lot of it for me was <clears throat> trying to understand myself 
right? What was going on with me? Why was I making, <clears throat> excuse me, these types of choices? Why was I getting in trouble? And then what I noticed is when I was getting into trouble, I realized that the people around me that were also getting in trouble tended to be people with brown and black skin. So I was like, there's something weird going on. Yeah. yeah. And so um, it's funny. I then, <clears throat> I, I, I tried school for a while. It wasn't successful. I was not a very mature 18 year old at all. And so I ended up dropping out of, uh, out of college and I just started, you know, doing my thing. And when at some point I realized, you know what, I think I'm ready to go back to college. And then it came, uh, what I brought with me were about three and a half years of experience of just living and seeing what I, what I saw. <clears throat> and I started just taking classes at first. And I was like, okay, let me just take a few classes in this. Let me take a few classes in this. And next thing I realized sociology as a discipline, it just spoke to me. It, it answered all the questions about myself and the world around me that I had about, you know, my involvement in deviance and in law violations and why I saw so many black and brown people also being caught up in that system. And um, I know, you know, I know a lot, of, we all have our own stories. I know I have a few friends that have told me, yeah, when I was young, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to become a college professor. And that astounds me because that almost kind of fell on me because it was taking classes. And then eventually I reached a point where my academic advisor said, you have to pick a major. And I was like a junior maybe, and I was like, okay. And I started looking through my, my, my course schedule and my previous classes. I said, gosh, I have a lot of sociology classes. I could probably get my sociology degree pretty, pretty quickly. She's like, yeah, I think you could. And then I got involved in an undergraduate research program for, um, for people of color. And that just like opened up this whole universe of possibilities. And so I started taking um, that a bit more serious. It's like, wow, I wonder if I could really do this. And so, um, but yeah, all of this, like the topic itself, it all comes from a source of like self-discovery, of self-understanding, of trying to better understand, yeah, like what, what led me to do the things that I did and why did, I, why did my life look the way that it did? Sure. That's really interesting because I think that that story resonates with a lot of researchers where they set out to discover more about themselves or some life situation happened to them and they wanted to understand more and understand why. So I think that's, that's, that's just a story that I think resonates with, with so, with so many, um, you know, let me also add and, and ask you about your, um, uh, your passion around analytics. Mm. So, you know, when was it that you identified, you know, you decided that analytics was also something that you were interested in, and it also was a way to help you, you know, tell the stories that you wanted to tell. So, you know, can you tell us a little bit about how analytics plays a role in your research? Yeah, absolutely. It, it, um, for me, what I learned are that, well, I guess I would, I would, I would, characterize myself as a skeptical um, empiricist. Sure. I feel like there are things out in the world that we can know, but I'm always like, do we really know those or we just do we just think we know those? But the more I started uh, in, in grad school kind of learning about, you know, research and learning about um, scholarship and learning about that process, I began to learn that there are that, that there are some empirical realities that I believe to be true. For example, that um, the system itself, whether intentionally or unintentionally, is inherently discriminatory. That is an that that's an empirical statement. And so then the quest became: Well, how do we know that? Because those types of statements get highly disputed of, yes, it is, no, it isn't, yes, it is, no, it isn't. And so then it was this process of like, well, how, if, assuming that's true, how do we know it's true? 
right? So another empirical statement may be women are disadvantaged in the labor market with regards to wages and promotions, an empirical statement, a statement of fact. Well, how do we know that's true? What is, what is the evidence we have to say, okay, this is how we know that. And so that's really my foray into um, analytics is it's really about evidence and about the evidentiary process we use to support our claims. Because as researchers, I feel like we say some really important things. We're not always listened to, which is, I've come to grips with that, but we do may say some important things. And at the very least, we should have conversations with each other, if not the general pu public, about what it is we know and how do we know it. And what that did is uh, the graduate program was, um, it was normatively quantitative, right? Uh, qualitative researchers weren't, I mean, just in general, I think this is true in a lot of different disciplines, but they're just not as valued or as recognized. Um, and so, you know, I was taught the way of statistics. I'd always been pretty good at math. And so then my orientation or, or my, my, you, my personal take on this was when you, is that there's things you can demonstrate with large data sets, large ends, large samples, and you can get this empirical leverage about, well, I'm not just, you know, assuming this to be true. I can actually demonstrate with 5,000 cases, with hypothesis testing, and with a designated alpha value, the extent to which I'm confident or, or the likelihood that this assertion is true, or at least um, the assertion that it shouldn't be rejected. <laughs> And, you know, and carrying on from that, because I'm assuming that you use um, the data that you, your research to help inform your teaching. And so, you know, not only are you an amazing scholar, but you've also been recognized for your teaching. You recently won the John Rayner Faculty Award for Teaching Excellence at Marquette. So how would you say that your research informs how you teach or informs what you teach? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, it does in so many different ways. I think one of the ways, like an indirect path, is that you're when you're engaged in research, by necessity, you have to be on top of your field. Like you have to know what's been published, you have to know what's out there, right? And there's always new research coming. It's That's not an easy task to do, to stay on top of like a discipline or a field. And so at the very least, you're forced to do that if you're engaging research in that area. But then more directly about like my research is number one, I've actually had many students involved in my research. I just had two student researchers this past semester. We're working on a pretrial detention project. So real briefly, um, individuals can actually be incarcerated before they're ever convicted of a crime. That's what we call pretrial detention. And so we're, we were trying to figure out, okay, well, what are the mechanisms in, and then what's the impact if you should have to, even if you're only incarcerated for, let's say, a week, as you can imagine, that would be really disruptive to your life, especially if you have a job, if you just disappear for a week and no one knew where you were, right? So they were trying to figure out, like, okay, so what's the, what's the implications of, of experiencing this? So we're, it's this new project, and I had two students um, working, helping, helping uh, my, my colleague and I, Dr. Andrew Ranson, in my department, um, and so for them, I think it's like they get to see how to do research and they get to see how you set up the questions and you collect the data and then you try to ensure that the data has some level of quality to it. So, um, for me, yeah, I think, so that's, that's, that's one direct path. And I think another direct path is then it allows you to talk about your work in your lectures and when you're talking and you can pull off of these experiences that you have firsthand knowledge of, right? Uh, and, and that I think also lends itself to some pedagogical advantages, right? When you're trying to connect with students and you can say, actually, yeah. So then I was doing a study on this topic that we're talking about. I, I actually, I, I, I still don't know if it's, <laughs> I, I, I joke that it's a, um, it's the result of my vanity. It's not, but I actually do assign some of my work in some of my classes, especially my race, crime, punishment class, because that's what I study. But right, and so then students can see that, oh, this is someone that is really immersed in this field. 
So I think there's a lot of different ways in which our research can really enhance our teaching. Yeah, absolutely. And so it's just so important for us, Scott, for us teachers to really stay on top of this. Um, so, you know, throughout your endeavors and in, in, in all of your research projects, what do you think is one of the one or a collection of the most important or surprising findings that has come out of your research? And, and you know, when you actually, you know, came in, in either maybe a, one or a couple of studies where you found this, uh, how did you feel? What did it make you feel like? Um, what was that experience like? Yeah, so I remember when I first started really diving into the punitive attitude stuff and of the public sentiment towards criminal justice. And I uncovered that, oh wait, people's views of crime do not shape their views towards crime policies, right? That would be the logical connection, right? Yeah. That your views of crime inform your views of crime policy. And when I found rather it tends to be people, people's views of race inform their views of crime policy, that to me initially was like that head scratching aha moment. Right. That the way that we understand justice yeah. is really complicated. And that there's so much baggage, especially in the United States, especially with regards to race. Yeah. That is the dilemma that American society has. It, it is that I've, I've heard analogies that it's the wound that was that has never healed. And I could not agree more that that those conversations are still super awkward. And we're hundreds of years removed from slavery, we're decades removed from the civil rights movement, and here we are today in 2020, and these conversations sound very much like they sounded decades ago. Like, how can that be? And because it's like the, it's just, it's the eternal elephant. And I think part of the problem is, is that we've never really had this true reckoning. I'm not even sure if today's climate constitutes that or not. Like, I don't think we'll know until like, you know, years down the road of whether this was the true moment or not, right? I don't think you know it when you're in it. You know it. The historians are the ones that kind of create, that was the moment. Um, but yeah, we've never really had that reckoning. And so for me, it just was like, not only was it consistent with my personal views on the matter, yeah. But it also just connected so many different dots for me, because then you start start you start thinking, well, if our public support for crime policies is fueled by racial animus, yeah. what does that mean for our crime policies? Yeah. Right? How? What then is the rationale for their existence, or for their expansion, or for their right, or for their just their state of being? And what you start realizing is, is that, oh no, this is bigger than that. Because if it's true that our views of race or our understandings of race or our views of racial minorities or people of color are informing our views of crime policy, then it could be the same case that, our, that the race issue is also informing then crime policy, right? Not just at the level of attitudes, but at the actual level of policy. And so I remember I was teaching, I, I did a guest lecture at an honor seminar several years ago, and I believe it was a philosopher that was teaching the class, and he just asked me to give this uh, a lecture on mass incarceration. And at the end, he just said, that is amazing. I just can't believe that that's the world we live in, that that's the U.S. And I said, yeah, it's pretty crazy. He's like, it's almost like crime, that addressing crime isn't the focus of criminal justice. Right. They said, I'm not always convinced it is, right. Right. right? And in fact, there's a whole wealth of research that suggests those things that crime policy is, is driven as much by social control, supervision, and your desire to suppress and, and, and manage certain groups, especially groups that can't contribute to the labor market, right? The ones that are under undereducated and poor in particular. And so then you start thinking, well, my goodness, that's not... Is that justice? Is that is that what we should be doing? Is that that's not even really you know? 
So anyways, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going off in a bit of a, of, of a bit of a digression. No. That's kind of like how that was a moment for me. When I realized that that was a moment. Sure. That, yeah, I, I think that's incredibly fascinating and something that I, I didn't know either. And, and you actually touched on it because I, you know, the next question that I would have too is as the intersection of other identities. So if we seek policy through our racial lens, you know, is that also coupled with class and how we see, as you said, um, people who are more highly educated or people who are part of the labor market? Um, you know, let's talk, you know, maybe religious minorities or even gender. And so how does, you know, our perspective on those different I intersecting identities also play a role in the shaping of those of those attitudes and in, in, on our um, criminal justice systems? So I think it's incredibly fascinating. And I, um, it, you know, and, and because of that, so you, 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 can, you know, you had this finding. I'm curious, do you think that, that, you know, can you tell us a little bit about how you see the impact of your work, it's your impact on people and implications for policy? So has, have you seen your work be disseminated to people to where it's also making informed decisions about, you know, our, our, our policy in, in the U.S.? Yeah, that's a bit more complicated. Yeah. Um, like sociologists have been talking about mass incarceration and the problems of mass incarceration for a long time. Yeah. Um, you know, 30 years, let's call it, right? The system kind of ramped up 40 years ago and within maybe 10 years, criminologists and sociologists were like, ooh, this doesn't look so great. <laughs> <laughs> There's going to be some, some, some problems here. <laughs> and... I would like to think that the current place we're in, we are, we are in a place where ramping up punishment, ramping up sentences, ramping up police forces is no longer taken for granted as being an automatic, of course we should, which it had for a long time. States were actually um, compromising and, and putting at risk state budgets. Wisconsin is one of those states in which they are spending over a billion dollars on corrections while the schools are being underfunded and social programs are being ripped away. And so they, they were make, having to make some really tough choices. And, and oftentimes, in many cases, there is choosing for more prisons. And so, you know, police forces need to expand? Yes, of course, we need to do that. And so, but now I feel like we are in this moment where, where now there is a pause of like, ooh, is that really what we should be doing? Sure. Yeah. Um, is that really best for quote unquote public safety? Mm -hmm. Um. I think what we realized, if this is complicated, so I don't want to overstate the point, but I think what we've realized now is, especially with the COVID situation, uh, courts are seeking um, non-incarceration non sentences more than they have in a long, long time. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing that those can have payoffs, that prison doesn't, or jail does not have to be the answer to every single question, yeah. right? That there's other options that in the toolkit and um, so I think that's that like the, like these types of things are benefits, like calls to defund the police, right? That wasn't a thing even five years ago. <laughs> now I think I think that claim is more nuanced. I think that makes for a very powerful protest statement, but I do think that claim is more nuanced. Most of the people that I know that 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 make those calls suggest that what it is it's really diverting funds. Mm -hmm. away from law enforcement to mental health practitioners and homeless shelters. And then based, because what you do is then you remove the responsibility of those issues from the police to social service agencies. One of the problems that has happened is, is that, and this is, and this is what makes law enforcement tricky is that we live in a situation where there was no social problem that we didn't fix with just police handling. Mental health problems, police will handle it. Domestic violence, let police handle it. Homelessness, let the police handle it. But the police are not equipped to handle all problems. They just aren't. We like to think they are, but they're not. Mm 
they're trained for very specific things and like mental health it, oftentimes it's not on their their menu of training it's become a little bit more common to be the case but even now it's mostly voluntary opting in so but but these types of changes i would like to think would not be possible if it wasn't for scholarship that has been pointing out for years the problems if you want to make criminal justice as big as expansive if you want to cast cast that broad of a net then you're going to have all kinds of problems and consequences that kind of spin off of that and i think people are starting finally starting to listen to that but again that could be <laughs> my own, or that, that could be just like, you know, grandiose or exaggerated self-importance because, I, you know, we've been saying that for a while, so I don't know why just now those types of messages are catching on. Um, I know that there has been, I've been in contact, I did some work on um, uh, collateral consequence, a uh, jury exclusion. So in uh, many jurisdictions, if someone gets a felony conviction, they're disqualified from serving on a jury. Well, the problem is, is that in the Constitution, well, it's been interpreted, the Supreme Court has interpreted from the Constitution that a jury should be a representative of a, of a defendant's peers. But what does that mean? So if a defendant is a uh, young Black man and you've, emo and you've removed all possible other young Black men from the possible jury pool, then can they have a truly representative jury of their peers? Um, or representative cross-section of, of their peers. And so I, I have had some uh, lawyers reach out to me that are trying to fight cases for their clients, asking about, you know, the, the, the jury process, what, what kind of legal argument they might pose or challenge there. So I've had direct conversations with attorneys. It, I think that that could be a direct link with some of my work, but for the most part, I, I, I guess I would hope that it was more of a of a of a broader impact that took many years to kind of finally sink in with the american consciousness that perhaps mass incarceration is not a good thing and perhaps we need to scale back and we need to do something different right and and you know it could be the the experiences you know brianna taylor kind of comes to mind or you know, these stories that are happening in the news and and that was a catalyst to then move to the scholarship so these mm -hmm. events happen and then they need, you know, they look to you, they look to scholars who know a lot about this to, to come up with solutions. And, and, and so mm -hmm. I think that, that what you do is incredibly impactful. And so, I, you know, and for me, I'm, I'm very hopeful with, with this change, you know, with the, the change in attitudes or it, you can kind of see a shift, at least for now. Now we'll see what happens post COVID and, and as the political landscape shifts. Um, but I, I like you and am, am, am hopeful that we can start to see change in this area. So let me ask you, what's next for you? What's next for you in your process of discovery? Well, um, this is a bit of news. It, it hasn't dropped yet, but um, I'm working with Dr. Robert Smith, Dr. Teresa Tobin, and uh, Ms. Marisola Chilichacho, she's a doctoral student in philosophy. And what we've been working on is, this is less, this is, this intersects with teaching, research, communities, like outreach, all of it. It's, we were kind of creating this, what we've created is what we refer to as the educational preparedness program for currently and formerly incarcerated students. Mm -hmm. And so it's a situation where Marquette is now entering the terrain of prisoner education. Okay, we, Marquette campus in particular, right, borders communities that have some of the highest rates of incarceration in the entire country. And I don't know if you heard of the film 53206, that's one of the highest, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so something that we've been working on now for quite a while is figuring out what is Marquette's contribution to this issue. Yeah. And so we just found out a few days ago that we received a large Mellon grant in the sum of three quarters of a million dollars to oh. start building out this program on Marquette for multiple years, working yeah. with 
MATC, Wisconsin Department of Corrections, and we are now ready to launch this thing and really build it out, expand it. And actually, we'll be looking for partners across campus that, that are interested in, uh, in teaching in the program. You and I maybe can have a conversation yeah. if you know anyone like that. But that is the next, that's what is um, next on the agenda that's really big. I also am working on the pretrial detention project with Dr. Andrew Ranson. That's another project that I think is going to start picking up a lot of steam in the next few months. And then finally, I'm working on a set, I'm, there's a sentencing project that Dr. Uh, that Professor Michael O'Hear from the law school and I are working on. Uh -huh. So that project, we, we've actually just submitted a paper and we're working on the second paper. So those are the three kind of projects that I'm juggling, but the prisoner education one, that was the big one that we just found out we got the grand award. So we'll be, that-, that That's will... incredible. That's such good, that is incredible news. So I'm so Thanks. glad you broke it here. Yeah, I did. <laughs> the Resource the Spotlight release, Series. <laughs> yeah, the press release hasn't even been, like, we're just now, like, we're, like, figuring out what the press release is going to look like. I, again, this is, we just found out, like, a couple days ago. So. And there you have it, folks. Breaking news <laughs> on the Research Spotlight Series hosted by the IWL. You've heard it here first. <laughs> that's incredible. I was, congratulations. That's so Thank exciting. You. Oh, my goodness. That's so exciting. And I, I do hope that you'll you'll come back for another episode to tell us how that's going. Because I think yeah. that would be, um, you know, I, I'm incredibly interested in that. So that would be, I hope you do follow up with us with that. Um, I do have uh, one more question for you before I let you go. So can you just tell us a little bit about how your research has had, you know, how it has it had a personal impact uh, on you? Yeah, um, boy, I think... I mean, I, I guess we, we all do research for different reasons. Um, you know, I remember when I was in graduate school, there was a project for a class I had to do. And the project was to interview a faculty member about their research, not so different from this. And I asked the professor that I was interviewing, she was a, a legal scholar, and I asked her, she said that her take was that um, people aren't really relevant, that it's about institutions and systems. Right? She was a systems person. She was an institutionalist. And I said, oh, that's kind of so like, what's people's role in social change? And she was like, ah, I don't know if we have much, you know, much role in that. And I felt that kind of sad. And so that was like, well, then what's the point of, of doing your research? And she said, intellectual curiosity. And I was like, okay, I get it, but that left me really unfulfilled. I was like, well, I mean, yeah, okay, great. Intellectual curiosity, that should be part of it. Yeah. But if that's all of it, then I feel like we're selling ourselves short. Um, you know, like research isn't, I, I guess research isn't just research. Research is about advocacy. It's about knowledge formation. It's about, it, it isn't always the, is it, it's not necessarily the, the, the it's not necessarily the, the necessary condition for change, but I think it can facilitate change. And so for me, um, like, you know, what do I get out of it? I, I get a sense of meaning in my life that I'm doing something productive, that I'm, that I'm, you know, I'm not part of the problem. I'm, I'm hopefully part of the solution or a solution. Um, but it is, it's all, it's, it's intellectual curiosity, but it's more than that. It, it's also like the feeling that we can't, that, that individuals themselves can have some level of impact on the world around us, that it's not all just chaos and it's not all just these forces beyond our control, that we have some level, even if it's at a small level, that we have some level of impact on the world around us. Like, I, like I need that. Like, I need that to feel good about myself. Yeah. Well, thank you, Darren. I, you know, yeah. I'd like to close out on that because that was that was impactful and 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 um, resonated with with me. So, thank you for that, and thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your pioneering research 
and your profound insights. It was just, it was such a great conversation. And thank you all for joining us. And we do keep, we do hope that you keep an eye out for our next episode. Thank you.